So let's get into a little bit of history. I'm going to read a little blurb here at the beginning just to set some set the tone of how Thanksgiving started in the in the modern era. Before arriving in America, Christian pilgrims had fled persecution in England, and we can relate some of this stuff even today and, and what's going to happen in the future. Christian pilgrims had fled persecution in England due to their Puritan beliefs and settled for a while in Holland in 1607. There they found themselves living, living among other persecuted groups, one of them being the Sephardic Jews exiled from Spain, and that's what Sephardic means. It means Spanish. In 1492, as most Americans know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But as every Jewish person knows, 1492 was also the year of the expulsion from Spain. As Jewish people were being hounded out and severely persecuted in Europe, God was opening the door to a new world of the Americas under the Spanish Inquisition. Jews were forced to choose between conversion, death, or exile. And many fled, including a group who ended up in the more tolerant country of the Netherlands. That Sepharic, which again means Spanish, that Sepharic Jewish community was later to become neighbors with, with our British pilgrims, who arrived at the beginning of the 17th century before making their way to a new, the New World, a new world that would become a haven for persecuted Jewish people in years to come. But these are the events that brought the paths of the British pilgrims and the Sepharic Jews to cross. And now what we're going to get into is we're going to relate how Sukkot and Thanksgiving are so closely related and how our modern Thanksgiving is actually derived from Sukkot. So in Leviticus, Levit, Leviticus 23:39, it says there, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, which is nearly October, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days, the first day and the eighth day, each a Sabbath. Could that there have been the first Thanksgiving? Could that have been the first Thanksgiving feast? Because it was based on what they had seen of, of the, the Jewish Sukkot celebrations here, back at all the way in Leviticus. And that set the tone. And that's that the feast of ingathering. And there's plenty in common with Thanksgiving and Sukkot. So let's go through some, some points. And they're just let's talk in history here. But both Thanksgiving and Sukkot both involve pilgrims. Just as the Israeli people used to make a pilgrimage feast to Jerusalem three times a year, which is part of the commandment, for the high holy days, so early Christian settlers in America were later known as pilgrims. So there's a correlation there. You look at Sukkot and you look at Thanksgiving, and both started with, with people or, or with groups that were exiled, persecuted, People that had to escape. And then you look at the third one. Both of them involved a harvest. Both of them enjoy joyful an ingathering and, and rejoicing over that ingathering. Both happen in the fall. And the fifth point, both are based on a bit the bib biblical command to give thanks. And this is where Sukkot is considered a model for thanksgiving. Both holidays revolve around showing gratitude. And we're going to talk a lot about gratitude and being thankful and being able to reflect and things that may interfere with our reflecting within our thankfulness. But it's about being thankful for the, for the bountiful har harvest. The next one, both are based around family and communal gathering. We try and get together for, for Thanksgiving and we have a big Thanksgiving meal Sukkot, you're supposed to have a gathering of people, as we went through already, and you're supposed to gather together. The seventh one, both involve a lot of food and a lot of feasting, and we're going to be doing a lot of feasting today, I know that. And the, the last one, 
which is kind of funny. They both involve what's called hodu, H-O-D-U. Hodu is the Hebrew word for Turkey, and it's also the word for the country of India. Roshan's going, what? <laughs> but it also means to give thanks, to give thanks. In English, we call that tasty roasted bird, we call it a turkey, thinking uh, that it originated from Turkey, but Israelis call it hodu, thinking that it came from India. Either way, Hodu is definitely on the menu that I like to have around this time of year, around Thanksgiving. But you can look that up, and it is in Scripture. It is, Hodu is in Scripture. You'll have to go through the Strong's Concordance. Some versions will actually have it written in there as a place called India. You can find it in Esther 1.1 1, 1 for, for your first reference. You see, though modern Thanksgiving has gotten away from the, the, the principles of Thanksgiving, it's gotten into set, been secularized. It's, it comes with the traditions now of, of football and parades, and it overshadows its religious, I don't like that word, but its religious origins and where it started off from. The core of the holiday, though, that we see and we, we serve today, and not, not serve, I shouldn't say that, but that we look at today and we have fun with, the core of it remains the same. It's an expression of gratitude for what we have. And this is where we got to sometimes look past some of the secular things and the secular ways of what it is. But it's about expressing gratitude to the Father for what we have. See, this gratitude involves thanking God, thanking God for the provisions that He has given us, for the blessings that He has given us. And when we start going into those thanking Him for the blessings and thanking Him for the, the provision, we're actually mirroring the ancient theme of what Sukkot was all about. And this is where the connection between Sukkot and Thanksgiving lies. It's that shared focus on gratitude. So as we go through this season, and maybe not every country around the world does it, but we do here where we're at, we go through this season People are off work and people have the weekend off. But it's that, that gratitude for the harvest, for the bountiful, plentiful that God has provided with us. And about taking time to express thanks for that harvest. you got to realize that back in the day, they didn't have grocery stores. They relied on that harvest that they had to get them through the entire year. And that was God's reminding his people and giving them a chance to be faithful during their, their times when they had to rely on him and during their, their wilderness journey where he took care of his people. But exercising that gratitude for that time, and we can see how they brought it over and they were exercising that gratitude time in the early years of even of America, the difficult years, and they were still expressing gratitude for the Father, one for their escape, just like it went back on what? They exited Egypt, and they lived in tents. They lived in Sukkots, and they were supposed to do certain things during those times. But that rejoicing in, that, that in God's care and God's provision, it lives on in the celebration even of thanksgiving. Even though it's not a biblical command, there's no command not to do it. There's no command not to, worry, to think about celebrating thanksgiving. It doesn't contradict God's creation, God's laws, God's commandments. It doesn't go against anything. It's derived from it. So I got two verses here about just being thankful, and then we're going to get into some examples of things that will interfere with our thankfulness. In Psalm 100, verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and say so to him. Blessed and affectionately praise his name. And that was Psalm 100, verse 4. And the next one is Isaiah 57, verse 19. Peace, peace to him who is far off. And I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. Both to him who is far off, both Jew and Gentile is what it's referring to there when you get into it. And to him who is near, says the Lord, I created the fruit of his lips, and I will heal him. 
I will make his lips blossom with a new speech in thanksgiving or thankful praise. So we can see here a couple verses about being thankful. Be thankful and say to him, blessed and affectionately praise his name. But when we get into being thankful, there's things that can come up. And maybe we have to reflect on this time of year too. And take some time and set some time aside. And, and just look at maybe some things that are holding us back. You see, it's very difficult to be thankful and entitled at the same time. Because you look at entitlement, it stems from the belief that you deserve something. And that diminishes gratitude. Because when you feel entitled, it's very hard to recognize the blessings as a gift from God. And that's why I, can, I sit there and I, I thank God when I pray at the, at the dinner table every time, I say, thank you, Father, because everything we have comes through your hands and we appreciate that in which you have, been, you have bestowed upon us. But we've got to realize that, that thankfulness, it requires acknowledging that the good things that come from him are not because of our merit, but because of his grace. Yes, there's things that we can do wrong, that will hold back the blessings. You go back to Deuteronomy 28, and you can look at the blessings and the curses and go through that for about 64, 64 verses. And you can see where the blessings come from and what we have to do to achieve them. You see, we can look at a modern example of this. You know, a person might receive a promotion at work. They may think it's owed to them. And they begin to forget that it's Not always their merit. Maybe it was their team that was, that, was, that was part of it that helped them get that promotion. And they forget those things. And they get into merit. And they don't acknowledge God's favor as who they are. And that can lead to what? That's exactly what entitlement is. Thinking that you're owed something without doing the work. The next one, it's very difficult to be thankful and unforgiving at the same time. And unforgiving. Because what's unforgiveness do? Unforgiveness is a root. Unforgiveness holds on to resentment. And then that resentment makes it pretty much impossible to embrace thankfulness. Because you can't be double-tongued, you can't be double-minded, you can't have one thing going on and be fully into the thankfulness of what God has provided for you. What, do you got like a 60-40 thing going on, 70-30 percentage-wise? No, God wants all of your thankfulness. He wants you to look at Him and be thankful for what He has given to us. So let's look at Matthew 18, 21 through 35, where there's somebody who has the example here of the debtor. The unforgiving servant, you know, is after being forgiven of a very large debt, he in turn, he refuses to forgive a minor debt to, to somebody else. And that's a, a lack of gratitude, a lack of gratitude, a lack of gratitude for his own forgiveness. And it makes him in, absolutely incapable of showing mercy. And you can see that as you go through that example. So let's look at a modern example and something that has popped up maybe in our walk and maybe you have your own example, but these are the ones that I picked. Someone's received forgiveness. It could be from a, a loved one, but refuses to forgive and holds on to, to a grudge. Holds on to the, to the wrong or even their perception of the wrong. But when they choose not to forgive, they choose to close themselves off to the joy they choose to close themselves off from, from the peace that gratitude brings because there's an absolute peace that comes with that. Let's get into the next one here. And this one's a little bit more complicated because it's often mis, misrepresented, misinterpreted. And it's difficult to be thankful and jealous at the same time. Jealous. Now let's get into what 
jealous is. In order to get into jealous, I like to back up and get into envy first because one leads into the other and they're so closely tied. You see, envy and jealousy are so closely related uh, and sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they're not quite synonymous with each other. There is a difference. You see, envy is a reaction. And if we can get this stuff into our heart, we can sometimes figure out some problems that we might have in life, some things that might be holding us back. Envy is a reaction to lacking something, something that another person possesses. You say, well, that sounds like jealousy. Well, what jealousy is, jealousy is a reaction to the fear or the threat of losing something. Often, could be someone something that we possess. But when we get into the thankfulness side of it, we don't look at those things and focus on those things. Thankfulness will shift our perspective. And I know Prophet Mike Terry did a, a big study over the last, he went probably for a few weeks there where he was talking about the words of our mouth and these kinds of things and the focus and what we, where you put your energy to is where, you, where, where things go. And this builds on a lot of that, but that thankfulness shifts the focus to what we have been blessed with. Instead of looking at our lack, we're looking at what? Giving thanksgiving to the Father. Instead of constantly comparing ourselves to your, situ your situation, which may be negative, and, and comparing it to others and being you know, jealous of, of what they're going through. So let's look at, put this envy into perspective with jealousy. So you get a, a material position, uh, p possession, uh, pick one could have been a person, it could have been a thing, it could have been anything. But they start feeling envious over neighbor's new car. And then they fear losing status to the neighbor because their car may be a little bit older, less prestigious. And this is where that jealousy stems from that fear. And that's how the two are intertwined and they get used so synonymously sometimes, but not quite synonymous. But we can't allow those things to overshadow the blessing and being thankful for what God has given us to date. The next one, it's very difficult to be thankful and have self-pity at the same time. We ever get stuck in those ruts? Oh, we can have some games played with us at times and if we fall into it, Sometimes you just got to tell your mind to stop it. Stop it and look at them for, for what we have instead of getting into the self-pity. Do you realize that a person in North America or in the United States, actually, it's an American study, a person in the United States who was on government assistance is in like the top 1% of wealth worldwide. Put that one into perspective. And then you can look at other nations and say, what's going on there? What? But we get into this position of self-pity sometimes. You see, it focuses on what's lacking rather than what is at present. How about you just walk out in nature? Just walk out in nature at some time and just thank God for the trees that are around you. Thank Him for the grass. Don't complain about the fact that you've got to cut all the grass. Thank Him that you actually have a lawn. Thank Him that you, you maybe live in an apartment. Thank Him that you have air to breathe and, and those things that He has provided for you. Whatever it be, get out. And that's what Sukkot, once again, is about. Getting out there and just enjoying the things that, and the provision that God has given and put, put around us. But self-pity, on, on the other hand, it blinds us. And it blinds us from the blessings that we do have in front of us, the things that we do possess. And if we refocus on some of those things, we can look at the blessing that God has given us. Given us. And when we can do that, now He can build on the blessing. He can build on it instead of taking it away from what He has already given us. See, a person goes through a tough time. Could be a, a financial season. And a lot of people will focus on what they've lost rather than being thankful for what they still have. Think about that one. But that mindset right there, you can get trapped in that. 
It'll block our ability to be thankful. Right in the midst of hardship, right when we need it the most, it'll block it off because we can get into these things of, of self-pity and loss instead of focusing on the, the 30% that you may still have. And it could be from family. It could be from assets. It could be anything. Focus on what God has given you. And when you start focusing on individuals, that's where you focus on the good that's in them. And let God deal with the other side of it. You're not going to scream anybody into submission. You're not going to yell at them and, and convince them against their will, as Prophet Steve did a teaching on that, uh, what, two weeks ago? Look at the good and build on the good within them and build your mindset of that person around that. The next one, and this one can be a trap for a lot of people, it's very difficult to be thankful and to be worried at the same time. What is worry? What is worry? Worry is rooted in the fear of the unknown. Let me ask people a question. Happens to a lot of people. Why are most people afraid of spiders? Most people are afraid of spiders because they don't know really anything about them. And that's where that fear comes from. If you knew all about them, you knew that this one can't harm me. Yeah, it's a little bit creepy, but it's not going to do anything. But a lot of people get into an absolute fear and a fear that will overtake them with, with things like that. But that worry, the unknown. But when we get into thankfulness, thankfulness will focus on God's faithfulness to his people, as his word says, on his provisions, once again, that he has given us. And when you're, you're being thankful, your heart is fixed. It gets fixated on what God has already done instead of about what I've got to do or what God hasn't done or, or any of these other aspects. But that pushes worry away. It will drive worry away if you can just stay into the faithfulness of God's provision again. Because people will get into things like anxiety about what lies ahead. Be thankful. Be thankful for what He has given you and don't get into that worry the fear of the unknown. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll go through 31 through 33. How's that? Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, perpetually uneasy, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to, to wear? But first and foremost, importantly, seek, which is aim to strive after his kingdom and his righteousness his way of doing and being right. And all these things will be given to you also. And that's a big one. But we're told there to strive after his kingdom and his righteousness. Two aspects there. Two aspects there. Not getting into it because that's an entire sermon which has already been covered before. You know, someone may be anxious about their job situation, constantly fearing the worst, but being thankful for your current employment and God's provision, God's past provision, that can ease the worrying. And that's where you're allowing trust in God, faith in God to take over. And when you get into that, God always takes care of his people. I know there's a big if that comes in there and letters about this big and high capital. If we're doing the things that he wants us to do and then people will get worried. Well, what am I missing? You do your best with what you know, and God will fill the gaps. He understands where you walk. He understands where you're at. But you've got to seek after Him. If you're not seeking, well, then you may as well just close the book and stop it. But you've got to seek after Him, and He can fill those gaps for you. But you've got to get in the game. You can't play the baseball game if you're not going to get on the field. The next one. Ooh. We've all probably got into this one at some point in time. It's very difficult to be thankful and covetous at the same time. Coveting is the desire for what belongs to others. And what drives being covetous? It's dissatisfaction with what you have. Dissatisfaction. And what's the antidote to that? 
Can we all say it? Thankfulness. Thankfulness is the antidote to coveting because it reverses your focus back to what you already possess. And when you start to focus back on what you already possess and start thanking him for that and thanking him for God's provision, you're not focused on that other aspect of it. You th get into the thankfulness and thanking him for what we've got. You know, we've gone through six examples. I've got five more that we're going to get through real quick. But over the course of the next day, two days, three days, and it doesn't, it's not restricted to Thanksgiving. It should be your daily prayer. We'll get that. We're going to end in that one. It should get into your daily prayer of thanking him. And it doesn't have to be the great things. Thank him for the things that you appreciate around you. Family, friends, not always the mores. Sometimes it's the nows and the things that you possess. The next one. Oh, I've got my hand up first on this one. It can be very, very difficult to be thankful and to be bitter at the same time. Thankful and bitter. Bitterness takes root when there's a lack of forgiveness. Bitterness takes root when there's unresolved hurt within your life. And thankfulness requires a heart that's open to God and God's grace and God's healing power and His blessings. But it can be very difficult to walk into those things harboring bitterness. But when you get into the things of God's grace, and you can focus on healings and the miracles, that will make it absolutely impossible to harbor bitterness at the same time. You can't have both. And we talk about double-minded. Man is unstable in all of his ways. Now you look at the way that words travel. They come into our head. We got to process. We got to make decisions. They get into our heart. And we can do things in our heart, rip them out. Because it says in Scripture, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then you can hear bitterness come out of some people's mouths. And I don't want you to get into judging people or anything like that. This is about looking ourselves in the mirror and seeing maybe there's a little bit of bitterness somewhere that we've got to go through. But don't let it take hold. You know, somebody can hold on to bitterness and it could be through broken relationships, constantly dwelling on the wrongs that were done to them. And they did this and they did that. But when you focus on what God has done within your life, thankfulness starts to dissolve the bitterness. Being thankful, again, we're talking people, we're talking personalities. Be thankful for the good that's in people that are around you. And that will start to erode that and dissipate all that. Let's go on to the next one. It's very difficult to be thankful and offended at the same time. Oh, we can get offended so easy sometimes. Sometimes we can hurt each other's feelings and, well, I'm not too kind with some of that stuff. I'm a little bit more coarse and a little bit harsher. But offense occurs. And we get offended when we feel like we've been wronged. But when you get into being thankful for things, that will shift that focus from being wronged to being blessed. See, these are all just mindsets that we've got to put ourselves through and perspectives to line ourselves back up with God's word so that we can walk and we can receive. And this is what this is about getting us to do. Reflect on our lives. And maybe you got a lot of check marks here and you've gone through that, and that's great. Matthew 5.32, or 5.23 and, and 24. So if you are pre presenting your offering to the altar, and while you remember that your brother has something, such as a grievance or a legitimate complaint against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering. See, offense hinders worship. Offense will hinder gratitude 
making it darn near impossible to genuinely give thanks and ask and give thanks to the Father because you're harboring a type of resentment after off of being offended. You see, someone may feel offended by, offended by could be a, a coggly comment at work and you, you take it to hurt. And, and some people are so easily offended. It's like, leave your feelings at home and they won't get hurt. Like, sometimes we got to toughen up as God's army. But if we're focusing on the thanks, thankfulness of the job that you have and what you do have, the opportunities that are there, God's blessing can help them. And he can help, them, help you let go of the offense. It's called sometimes just let water roll off a duck's back. Other times there's got to you got to let things address it. Some you got to address some things. Obviously, as we just read, but re maintain a positive attitude. Did that person really mean and really try to hurt me, or is it me that received that? Is it me that took the hurt and made it personal? Sometimes you just got to let things roll off to, roll off a duck's back. Because talks in scripture about a causeless curse is without what? Cause. It means nothing is what it's talking about there. And you can take that and you can apply that there. You know, in Romans 13, 7, Paul instructs the believers to give honor where honor is due. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. That's the next one. Let's get into the next one. It's very difficult to be thankful and dishonoring at the same time. What's dishonor? Dishonor. We went out for dinner with my parents last night for their 60th wedding anniversary. My brother, my sister, my, my daughter was there, grandkids were there. My son wasn't, couldn't make it. And you get into this and it's about honoring as scripture talks about honoring. But dishonoring comes from a place of pride. Dishonoring comes uh, from a place of rebellion. But what's thankfulness do? Thankfulness will get you to recognize value in other people. It will get you to show respect for authority. It will get, to, get you to show respect for your parents. It will get you to respect positions God has placed people around us and the things that he has done. Romans 13, 7. Pay to all what is due. Tax whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Respect to whom respect. And honor to whom honor. <coughs> Let's look at an example that we can put that into context with. A person may honor their parents. They may honor what God has set in the fivefold ministry around them or anywhere, any of the offices, office of helps. It's about recognizing sometimes. But sometimes leaders, because they feel entitled, sometimes they, people get into independence. When we get into being thankful for the guidance and the provision given to people by God, whether it be through parents, whether it be through leadership, they start to honor them more fully and all the way through. And these are scriptural principles to be thankful, the thankfulness leading into blessing. But it's recognizing, and sometimes it's a mind shift. The tenth point, and the second last that we're going to talk about, it's very difficult to be thankful and to be selfish at the same time. Selfish. Selfish. What's selfish focus on? Selfishness focuses on inward. It focuses on inward thinking. It focuses on you. And let me get, you, get it down to something. When you're into selfishness, you're into lust. Because lust takes, love gives. Now, you look around those who are taking from you all the time, they might have a problem. You look at those who seem to be willing to help, willing to give and work on things, you're looking at another aspect. You're looking at love. That's the opposite of selfish. But when you start uh, focusing on the thankfulness of what you already have, you're willing 
to express outwardly to others. And that is the difference between being selfish and not being selfish, between being lustful, which is tied right in there, to being and expressing love. But the greatest of these is love, doesn't it say in Scripture? Isn't the two great commands, love the Lord thy God, love your brother and sister, your neighbor, your love yourself? Isn't that what, what Jesus talks about when he gets into that in the New Testament? And what he's referring back to is the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the first five or what? Basically about how to treat God, maybe it's six. And the last ones are what? How to treat your brothers and sisters? That's exactly what he was talking about. And that's where he summed up the entirety of the Tanakh. And that's what he was talking about. But we can't get caught up in ourselves. We can't get caught up in focusing on things like personal gain. It's an outward expression. What about a modern example of that? Somebody who hoards their resources. Somebody who might refuse to share with others out of selfish, selfishness. You know, when we focus on how much God has provided for us, it's very easy, it very easily becomes natural to, in our relation with God and that expression of God through us to be generous, to be giving, to be stewards of what you have. Stewards of what you have, not owners. That's the big thing. God owns everything. He's the giver and he's the taker. He's the giver and he's the taker. The last one we're going to talk about today. It's very difficult to be truly thankful and prayerless at the same time. Very difficult, pretty much impossible. Because what's prayer? Prayer leads to communication with God. And it takes communication with God to say, God, thank you for that tree. God, thank you for that lawn. Thank you for that birdhouse. Pick your whatever you want to pick. But whatever you're being thankful for, you have to have that line of communication with God. And that's where prayer is important. And it doesn't have to be three Hail Marys and all this other stuff. Just communicate with Him. Communicate with Him. Reverence Him as God, but communicate with Him like you would talk to me, like you would talk to your wife, your spouse. And that's all He wants. You can get into a deeper thing and learn about that, but give God something to work with sometimes as you're driving down the road. God, thank you that we live in an agriculture area where there's plenty of food around. We have these resources, whatever it be. But focus on that and lead into a level of communication that can be built and built and built. In Philippians 4, verse 6, and this will be the last verse for today as well, Paul encourages believers to pray with thanksgiving. Don't be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, in every circumstance and in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. Even when you have desires and you have wants and you maybe you have needs that you recognize, bring your petitions to God and you can examine that a little bit further. But you look at a modern example. Someone may go through life without regular prayer, only seeking God when they're in trouble. Don't we hear that? Oh God, help me. He's like, yeah, what about last Wednesday? when you could have prayed for somebody else and helped somebody else and gone through that process too. That's not a shot at anybody. I'm not trying to get anybody. I'm trying to say, get into being thankful. It's a really good start that can leave into, lead into a, a very productive prayer life that will make and change things in other people's lives. And that's true love instead of people always having to do it for you while you receive and you take and we're back into the lust thing again. As we go through these and we went through these, I hope you had an opportunity reflective over the next few days. Get some perspective on, on some of these things. Look maybe where, hey, I might have a little issue here and clean it up with God. He's there waiting to hear from you. He's waiting to hear from you. He's waiting for you to bring forward 
your thanksgiving to him. What? And enter his courts with praise. His courts with praise. But we look back and we can see all these things. They all, the way through, they all tie back into Sukkot as well as thanksgiving. See that, that, that connection between thanksgiving and Sukkot, it lies in the shared focus of gratitude for the harvest as, as one of God's provisions. You know, the two holidays are, are completely distinct in their cultural, completely distinct in religious context, but their underlying themes of thankfulness, provision, communal celebration, link them together. And that's where the where, where Sukkot, the point in time of rejoicing, we can do that on a daily basis. We can do that on a daily basis. But as we focus on this time of year in our culture that's around us, and people have the day off work and a holiday, spend some time rejoicing and thanking God. And this is why I don't mind celebrating Thanksgiving. I hope you learned something today. I hope you got through some things in life that may be holding us all back. Hope you got educated a little bit. And just understand the history of some of the other things that we do in our culture are rooted to some very evil ways. And there's some things that we do within our culture that are not rooted in evil ways. And when God said abstain from all appearance of evil, he meant abstain from all, all appearance of evil. You want to get into a study on that one? Study it out. It may change your perspective of what all is. All is anything that is contrary to the resemblance of Scripture. Contrary. Things that go against it. I hope you enjoyed. Let's close in prayer, and we're going to go have some hoodoo in a little bit.